Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Dennis Stoda. Dennis, nice to have you here. Thank you, sir. With Tracy Gone. So it's an important topic we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. And we know from the American Cancer Society that over 36 million Americans still smoke cigarettes. And now that's about 15% of the population. But what's interesting, if you go back to the 1960s, more than 40% of Americans smoked cigarettes. Unbelievable. Yeah, so we have made a lot of progress, but still 36 million smokers in this country. And, you know, the other ways to smoke tobacco, cigars, pipes, hookah or water pipes, those are all on the rise. Tobacco, as we all know, or most of us know, is the single largest preventable cause of disease in the entire world. And 80% of lung cancer deaths are the result of smoking. Wow. The longer than you smoke, the greater the risk. Good thing you and I quit when we were younger. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it's hard, though. It is, and we know that uh, nicotine is extremely addicting. But, of course, it's not lung cancer that kills most people who smoke. It's circulatory or cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. Gosh. So if you are still smoking or someone you love is still smoking, maybe it's time to think about quitting. Maybe in a big way, time to think about that. And maybe this will help you each year. The third Thursday in November is the American Cancer Society's Great American Smokeout. And that's a, a day that's really dedicated to encouraging people to quit smoking. And while it's really, really hard, as Dr. Shive said, because we know nicotine is one of the most addictive substances available. A new study at Mayo Clinic is looking at some new ways to help people succeed at quitting by combining lung cancer screening with some proactive referrals and increased communication with smokers. Help them understand what's at stake and, and how quitting can be possible for them. So here to discuss lung cancer screening and smoking cessation are pulmonary and critical care physician Dr. David Mattoon. Thank you for being here. And also internal medicine specialist, Dr. Taylor Hayes. Yeah, welcome to both of you. Good to have you on the program. Thank you. The, Thanks, at the time Dennis. of the, uh, the Great American Smokeout. So we want to talk about uh, new ways to quit smoking and the new program at Mayo, but I'm, we're also interested in this lung cancer screening program, uh, which I think uh, you were in charge of or have an important uh, part in the program, Dr. Midtoon. So, so tell us about that. Obviously, can, lung cancer, like most cancers, if you catch it early, you got a shot, and I assume that that's what your program is all about. Right, Tom. That's exactly the philosophy behind it. A privilege to be back with you. We had a chance to talk about this a few years ago and happy to bring some updates. So lung cancer screening was shown to be effective through the National Lung Screening Trial, which is a study of over 53,000 people randomized between low-dose CT screening and chest X-ray. And in the low-dose CT arm, there was a reduction in deaths, mortality reduction uh, with screening. Uh, chest X-ray subsequently has been shown not to be effective uh, in a separate randomized trial that are separate trial looking at chest x-ray versus no screening whatsoever. Now you say low dose, you mean that the amount of radiation is, is minimal because normally with a CT scan you get a fair amount of radiation. Correct. It depends on the, the method that the CT is done and this is geared at low dose because potentially we're recommending screening for 15 years or longer uh, for those who are at high risk. So we want to reduce the dose as much as possible. It's not no risk but it's low risk and low dose radiation with the CT. The estimate there um, is about 1.5 and the measurement is millisieverts. Compare that to being on the planet for a year, we get about three millisieverts of radiation. So it is very low dose. When you say at risk, who is at risk? So anyone who has smoked a significant amount is at significant risk for lung cancer. And we define high risk from the guideline perspective, as far as who to be considered for CT screening, as somebody who is age 55 to 80 and has a 30-pack year history. That's the equivalent of smoking a pack a day for 30 years. And how about people who are still smoking? And an active smoker only okay. continues to accelerate that risk. Uh, there is some additional risk that just comes with aging. So even after you quit smoking, there is some increase in risk with lung cancer, for lung cancer. Dr. Hayes, expand on this a little bit and tell us about the Mayo Clinic study and, and by sort of offering this one, two, three punch, what's different about this than the usual smoking cessation program? 
The idea behind this program, which uh, came out of a, a grant application through the National Cancer Institute, was to integrate smoking cessation and lung cancer screening. Makes perfect sense, right? Because as Dave often says to me, uh, lung cancer screening reduces the mortality from lung cancer, but the thing that reduces mortality from lung cancer better than anything else is to stop smoking. Sure. So we want to integrate both those, and, and now that lung cancer screening is part of the healthcare care landscape, uh, insurance payers are paying for it, M Medicare pays for it, we know that people will take advantage of that. Uh, the National Cancer Institute said we want to know how well and in what ways can we integrate smoking cessation intervention with lung cancer screening. People who come into the program are obviously going to be, uh, many of them are going to be smokers, and so this is an uh, obvious opportunity to, to intervene with those folks and help them stop. Do you find um, you have different kinds of patients coming in? There may be the one guy who says, oh, good, I'm in the clear, I can keep smoking, or other people for whom it's a wake-up call. This is serious. Uh, Dave can, will probably want to respond too, but I, I think that uh, it's both. Uh, and one of the things that we don't know is the answer to that question. If people get negative scans, do they uh, are they less motivated to quit? Uh, do they have the sense, oh, I've got a reprieve or I'm in the clear? And on the other hand, is lung cancer screening just the, the process of coming in and thinking, I know I'm at risk, I, now I understand what that's about, um, I'm really motivated to try to stop, and we don't know, and that's one of the things that we wanted to try to answer with this study. But y you may have some additional insights, Dave, about uh, that I'm in the clear and, and perhaps I shouldn't yeah. stop. So the process of lung cancer screening is fairly easy in the sense that it's done with a CT scan uh, in a single breath hold that takes less than 15 seconds and you keep your clothes on. Uh, it's painless in that sense. Um, but as you said, it's more important to tie that into smoking cessation as well as far as doing the, the most optimal combination in reducing your chance of dying from lung cancer. So a, a patient goes in to see their physician, maybe for their yearly physical, uh, they're still smoking, so their physician says, you know, you ought to be screened for lung cancer on a yearly basis. They come to you and you say, hey, listen, uh, your, your scan looks pretty good, but have you ever thought about quitting smoking? And then you refer them on to uh, Dr. Hayes's group to get help with smoking, stopping smoking. Right, so that would be the routine process uh, outside of the study. If, if the patient comes for screening and uh, meets the eligibility criteria and doesn't meet any of the ineligibility criteria, then and, they, and we go through what's called a shared decision-making process, so they learn about the potential benefits and harms of screening and agree to proceed. It, and our current smoker, at that point, they would be offered enrollment in the study. So actually, potentially before they've had a CT scan done, or alternatively, if they are in the program, and we have over 3,000 uh, patients in the program at eight different sites, and they come for their next annual scan, and are a current smoker, then they'd be offered enrollment in the, in the study. And we know that physicians and even employers have offered incentives to people to quit smoking. And, and Dr. Hayes, it seems like there are some other tools that are available that may not have been 10 years ago that would make success more likely. Sure, yeah, there are lots of tools. I mean, there are medications that can help. Uh, the most recent is varenicline, or, or the trade name is Chantix, but it's been a number of years now that that's been on the market. The most recent evidence for that uh, has been related to the safety of the drug because there were a number of questions about safety and those were answered with a very large study that was published in 2016. The other things that have changed in the landscape um, include and, and um, relevant to our study is the ability to reach out to patients through mobile devices, text messaging, uh, and the internet. And in fact, the, our study is to look at those kinds of interventions. How do we connect with patients uh, on web-based and text messaging, as well as using face-to-face -face counseling. And we, what we are wanting to demonstrate is that we can increase the reach of these kinds of interventions. More support in a number of ways. Right. 
Uh, it's in your pocket. Uh, yeah. So you, you, their phone goes off and it says, uh, don't pick up that cigarette. Huh? <laughs> in a way, yes. <laughs> All right. We've been talking about lung cancer screening and a new study being conducted at the Mayo Clinic to try and help people quit smoking. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, e-cigarettes and also the benefits of uh, quitting and tell you how you can get a hold of the Mayo Nicotine Dependence Center if you'd like to quit smoking. Plus, Dennis, we got a myth or matter of fact. Yeah, this is interesting. Myth or matter of fact, your heart rate and blood pressure can drop in just 20 minutes after you quit smoking. So we're going to find out the answer to that very soon. True or false? You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Dennis Stoda. We are back talking about lung cancer screening and smoking cessation with Dr. David Midtoon and Dr. J. Taylor Hayes. And myth or matter of fact? Yeah, uh, the myth or the fact is that just 20 minutes after you quit smoking, your heart rate and your blood pressure drop. Only takes that long. So is it myth? Is it a fact, Dr. Hayes? It's true. Wow. Blood pressure and, and pulse rate will drop quickly after stopping smoking, usually only... Uh, Less than an hour or so. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So how long then does it take? How long do you have to be have quit uh, before you reduce your risk of a heart attack? The risk of heart attack really goes down very quickly. So within a year of stopping, your risk of having a heart attack is about 50% of the risk of people who continue to smoke. And after about three years, it goes down to the level of the person who's never smoked. So it's really? a very rapid decline in risk for cardiovascular events. Pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. That's amazing. And what about... Uh, lung cancer. Yeah. How long does that take? It takes a little longer. <laughs> and um, Dr. Mattoon could address this too. But if you, most of the data suggests that it takes 15 to 20 years for the risks to accumulate. People who... Uh, s- who started smoking a year ago or five years ago aren't at much risk. People who started smoking 15 and 20 and 25 years ago are the people who are at most risk because it it takes that long of an exposure. And so you can imagine that it takes a while after you stop the exposure to have the risk reduce. And most of the studies suggest it's 10 to 15 years to drop to its lowest level. And for people who are heavier smokers, um, there, there probably is some remaining increased risk of lung cancer their life long, but it does go down to very low levels after 10 to 15 years. Dr. Midtoon, as a former smoker, and Dr. Shives confessed he is too, uh, we're both guilty. What's happening in my lungs within that period immediately after I quit smoking? Do things heal inside of us? So there's some inflammation that occurs with active smoking that takes weeks to months to settle down afterwards. And Occasionally, we'll find changes on a CT scan, even if the inflammation from that is is dramatic enough. But um, those immediate effects on inflammation in the bronchi do take days to weeks to settle down. As far as the lung cancer risk goes, as, as Dr. Hayes mentioned, it's a 20-year lag time, usually, between onset of active smoking and when one would potentially develop a sig- significant risk for, for lung cancer. On the flip side of that, the, the lung does remember that exposure. And compared to an active smoker who con- t- continues to smoke, say at age 55 when they might be considered for lung cancer screening, the risk is significantly less if you quit compared to if you continue. But then there's the age-related increase in risk for lung cancer that we all have, even as never smokers. Um, that comes into play so that even 15 and 20 years after quitting, your risk at that point is higher than it was at the time that you quit, say at age 55. Okay. And basically, I think you're both saying it's never really too late to quit. That's true. And and studies have clearly shown that if you quit by age 40 or early 40s, you avoid nearly all of the excess risk for disease uh, and uh, quality of life reduction that, that people have when they smoke for their life long. Um, and it's never too late because people who quit when they're 55 or 65 still add years to their life. The 40 or 45 year old will add 10 years. The 50 to 55 year old will add six to seven. The 65 year old will add two to three years of life. And it's not just adding years of life, it's, it's better quality of life. So Wait. what's the average life expectancy for a smoker? Because it, for, for people who, on average, Americans are living to age 78, 79, but not smokers, right? Right. It, it depends. It, uh, when it's, you it's, started and how it long. It depends huh? on the dose, yeah. you know, how, how much you've been exposed to. So if you've been a, 
one plus pack per day smoker, you're going to reduce your life expectancy by 10 to 15 years. In some groups who are very heavy smokers, for example, in people with serious mental illness and schizophrenia who are heavy smokers, their life expectancy is 25 years less than, than their non-smoking cohorts. Wow. There's not much good to say about smoking, is there? Not much. <laughs> So there, there is some encouraging and motivation, it sounds like, for people who come through this new Mayo Clinic program, and, and people can even participate in the study. Uh, Dr. Mintoon, how does one enroll? So one can either be referred by their primary care provider or call the program directly. The number is 507-538-0340, or as I say, they can be referred um, by their provider for an initial assessment as to whether or not they would be a candidate, and if they are, then they'd be scheduled to come in for the shared decision-making and the, potentially the CT scan. All right, we'll give that number again at the, uh, at the end of the program. But, uh, Dr. Hayes, so I want to ask you about e-cigarettes, because there, is, are, there are some people who I think believe that an e-cigarette can help you quit smoking. The data is very limited. There are only a very small number of studies that have looked at it. Um, I'll say that... Uh, some of those studies suggest there may be some benefit. The problem with e-cigarettes, however, is the, the, the lack of, of extended studies or uh, a number of people repeating the same studies to show us that it really is truly beneficial. And that when we talk about e-cigarettes, we're not talking about a single product. If I talk, if you ask me about nicotine patch therapy, although there are a number of different manufacturers, they're all the same. If you talk to me about e-cigarettes, there are about four or 500 different products on the market, and there are about five to 6,000 different nicotine solutions available on the market. Uh, and as you know, the FDA only last year began the regulation of e-cigarettes and e-cigarette uh, solutions that go in those e-cigarettes. So it has been up to now the Wild West, and it's not a single product. My impression right now is that if you're committed to a plan to quit smoking, the best approach is to use the things that we know work and that are safe which are the, the, some behavioral intervention, counseling, web-based text messaging, as we've talked about for our study, and the FDA-approved medications. And what's your success rate now? Uh, yeah, I know you have several different programs, but overall, people who come to you for help in quitting smoking, how many of them actually end up quitting six months later? So in, in, a, in the Nicotine Dependence Center program for people who we see either in the hospital uh, while they're hospitalized or see in the outpatient clinic uh, at six months, about 29 to 30 percent are not smoking. We have a residential program where at six months our quit rates are about 54 percent. If somebody tries to quit on their own, the chances of success are really a challenge. Quitting unassisted, you have about a two to three percent chance that you'll be abstinent at six months. And isn't it also true that the average smoker tries to quit what is it, five, six, seven, eight times oh, before I'd they say, actually do? <laughs> pick your number. Uh, it, you, you know, most studies suggest it's at least five or six, and, and many patients tell me it's been dozens and dozens um, that they've tried to try, tried to quit. It's a process, and what it says is that all, all addictions, including tobacco dependence, are remitting and relapsing, meaning they, they come and go. People's motivations for staying quit sometimes wanes, and they'll have relapse. But we know that that process is important to get people to that final point where they're permanently abstinent. All right, the lung cancer screening number, once again, 507-538-0340. And you can sneak in the back door to the smoking cessation program, can't you? Yeah, we'd love people to come into the study because we, we would help, like to help them quit smoking. We've been talking about quitting smoking with pulmonologist Dr. David Midtoon and internal medicine expert Dr. J. Taylor Hayes. Thanks so much, both of you, for being with us. Thanks for having us. Pleasure.